Pennington. Now we're starting to get into the properties of water. In this section, we'll talk about chemical and physical properties of water, how viscosity, inertia, and physical parameters of water uh, vary with scale, how water moves, and we can talk both about how it moves through the environment or how organisms move through it, and then the big forces that move water and, that are, and small ones that are important. And what I'll try to do is, as we go through this is link it to the biology. Why is this biologically important, right? So part of the reason I got excited about this class, the physics all of a sudden applied to the, my biophilic nature, the, the, the enjoyment of bio, biological properties. Okay, so we have water. Um, important characteristics here, listed here, and they are um, mostly dependent upon a very key feature of water, and that is the hydrogen bonding in the water. I'm not sure what the next slide is. No. Okay, so remember, water has one oxygen and two hydrogens, right? And those hydrogens are bonded to that oxygen at an angle. And so one side of that atom has more negative charge associated with it. Which part? Do you remember in your chemistry? Where are the electrons tending to be on that atom? So we've got that's correct. So we have what water? two hydrogens, right? And the negative charge tends to move towards that oxygen, and the positive charge tends to move here. And this angle happens to be about 104 degrees. Because the negative moves towards one side and the positive moves towards the other side, this is referred to as a polar molecule. And so things that have charge can dissolve well in them. Things that don't have charge, that are nonpolar. And then you can imagine that this minus is going to be attracted towards that plus. Right. Okay, so when that happens, um, what happens when ice forms? What, what would get formed? So, so um, Bronson mentioned that the molecules are bouncing around in the gas. They're also bouncing around in the water as well, right? So what happens as you cool down the, to the rate that the molecules are moving as you cool it down? Right, they slow down, good. And so that means they have more chance of interacting with each other because they don't have so much energy to pull this hydrogen bond apart. So eventually, what happens when water forms? Gas flow between the molecules. Right. It, it, it assumes a crystal structure, and the molecules are actually held in place with these gaps in between them, right? And so what does that do to the density of the water? Right, it lowers it. So basically, it means that ice floats on top of water. This is a very unusual property for liquids. Also, because of this hydrogen bonding, it means that water is at liquid form, or can be at liquid form, at the surface of the Earth. Just the fact that it can exist as a liquid is, makes it unusual in and of itself. What are some other chemicals that live, that can exist as a liquid on the surface of the Earth under normal temperatures and pressures. Mercury. Mercury. Got one. What else? There's not a lot of mercury around, luckily for us. No. So it's a major problem. But um, what, what what else is uh, common? Um, commonly assumes a liquid form.
Ethanol, that's a good one. Okay, so, he, so he's got the Aggieville mindset going now. Um, what else in addition to ethanol? What, what else in addition to ethanol? I mean, you're, you're getting into a class of compounds that has a whole bunch of uh, liquid form on, on the surface of the earth. Okay, how many of you drove here today? Gas, right? So gases, oils, cooking oils, right? A lot of organic molecules also have liquid form on the surface of the earth. But most other elements and most other forms don't do that. So that makes it very un un unusual. What's really maybe even more unusual about it is that it can form solid, liquid, or vapor at the range of temperatures and pressures that we have on Earth. Right, so it can go into all three of those forms, and so it's essentially at a triple point, if you'll think about, if you want to think about it that way. So, that, so again, this all comes down to this hydrogen bonding and the way it reacts um, with itself, and it has temperature changes. Should use picture mute, not. Okay, so some of the other factors that this leads to then, uh, this hydrogen bonding, they lead to the fact that it has relatively high density. That is, water is really heavy. And anybody who's tried to carry five gallons of water up a hill knows how heavy water is, right? It's very dense. Um, and that density is so fundamental that it defines how we think about units of, of um, <coughs> measurement, right? So many of our units of measurement roll around water. So for example, what is a gram? What's what's a gram? How's a gram defined? Which is a fundamental unit of mass. Milliliter of water. Yeah, right. One cubic centimeter of water. Exactly. Right. So a gram is exactly that. Um, density is basically defined on the density of water. So a density of one is water at its maximum density. We'll talk about that in a second. So, um, also, units of, of heat are also um, dependent upon water. How much energy it takes to heat one gram of water up one degree C is a fundamental unit of heat. Right? So we, we revolve around these, these physical properties of water. Um, it, because of this hydrogen bonding, it causes high density. We already talked about surface tension, right? That they're holding, those bonds are sort of holding each other up near the surface of the water and causing a, a, a tighter layer there. Heat of vaporization, it takes a lot of energy to, to cause it to form gas. It takes a lot of energy to boil water, which is another way of looking at it, right? Heat capacity, it can take a lot of heat to raise a, a degree of, of temperature. This idea of this liquid on the Earth's surface we already talked about. The last one is that water is an excellent solvent. That is, it can dissolve, dissolve many, many things. It's, it's a, you know, a universal solvent. And this is important both for bio, biology because we need to dissolve chemicals in our cells to make them work, but also it's central to the way water weathers the Earth's surface and how nutrients get and salts get into water from the surface of the land. Um, There's some other properties of water that are, that are key to the way it works, and we'll see these pop up again and again in the class. Um, ions tend to be more soluble in warmer water, and gases become less soluble in warmer water. So when you boil water, the gas completely comes out of it. But as you get closer and closer to boiling, you tend to be able to get more salts into solution. So a practical example of that, you have a glass of hot tea, a glass of iced tea, you put in two tablespoons of sugar into each, which one goes in first? Right, the, the, the hot tea, right? Because it's, because it's 
of dissolving that in faster. And so how do you overcome that in the iced tea? How do you get that sugar in there? You stir it, right? So what you're actually doing is physically increasing the rate of diffusion of the ion into the solution by stirring. And we'll get into that, the idea of turbulent mixing versus static molecular diffusion being important as well. And the final one is this unusual relationship between temperature and density because it really determines how a lot of how lakes work in particular and actually how the ocean works um, in global uh, biogeochemistry. So here's the plot. Um, on the x-axis we have temperature degrees C. It goes from 0 to 30 on this x-axis, sort of the you know, normal range of temperatures. This is a hot day here and this is a pretty cold one. And the density on the y-axis over here, 1, and the maximum of 1 is, well, as I mentioned, the defined, density is defined on where water is the most dense, and that's basically 1 gram per cubic centimeter is that density. And what we can see here is that as water freezes, it becomes much less dense. But then the other peculiar thing is, is that it becomes more dense, and then it becomes less dense. So at about 3.9 degrees C, there's a density maximum. So that cold water is the very most dense part. And so we have this idea of this, this change in density over time on this axis. This graph on the top is one that I very frequently in the exams ask students to reproduce pretty much exactly. Okay. That is, label the x-axis with units going from you know, 0 to 20, 0 to 30 or something. Put the correct numbers on the y-axis, realizing that these changes here are happening at about a thousandth of a, a thousandth of, of a density unit, right? 0 0.001, then you're dropping each by each. And then you have this break that gets you down to about 0.925, and that's sort of where the density of ice falls. Then it goes up a little bit to four degrees, and then it starts falling off more and more rapidly as you increase above that point. So this is one where before the next exam, you should be able to sit down with a piece of paper and just draw it out. It is so central to the way lakes stratify, freeze, turn over, um, the way rivers mix into reservoirs, the way all of biology works, that I, I think it's important enough for you guys to, to memorize that. So as I mentioned, I like you to know how to use graphs. If you can come up with a graph, it'll describe things faster. Some graphs I can make you come up with, and this is one that I think is fair game. Okay, so there's the maximum density point. And then the final point here is that as you heat the water warmer and warmer, the difference in density for each, say, five or 10 degrees C becomes greater and greater as you get out here, right, as you get warmer. So that, that, that 10 degree difference is less of a density difference than that 10 degree difference, the two green lines there. This is important because if you go to tropics, you'll have lakes that stratify <coughs> even without a cold season. And it's, it takes, and it's because it takes much less of a temperature differential between the top and the bottom at warm lakes than it does in cold lakes to stratify. Okay, so we'll get we'll get back to this, but it's a, and uh, and this is not the last time we see this. 